Okay, so I'm going to read this beautiful calculation. So, um, we should actually probably say something about the next assignment, the second writing assignment. Uh, the instructions are pretty simple, um, but I know sometimes people find them hard to understand. So um, it's due a week from Thursday. And the main part of the instructions is <clears throat> carefully state some apparently undeniable truth from common sense, physical science, or mathematics. For example, I have two hands. One body can cause another body to move by pushing it. A line contains infinitely many points. Explain briefly why Barclay nevertheless appears to deny it, right? Though, even though it's apparently undeniable, it seems that Barclay denies it. <laughs> Finally, respond on Barclay's behalf in the following two parts. So Barclay is going to say both of these things. And this is what Barclay does over and over. So Barclay is going to say, A, I don't deny the statement if it is understood correctly, right? So you have to explain how Barclay would interpret the statement such that he says it's right. And then B, I do indeed deny the statement on another way of understanding it. But when you understand it that way, it is neither good common sense, nor good mathematics, nor good physics. And in fact, it is absurd. Right, so Barclay is going to say, you, you have to get give Barclay's interpretation of the statement according to which he says it's true, and then you have to give the his the bad interpretation according to which Barclay says it's absurd. Um, okay, are there questions about that? Okay. I know there have been questions about what that means in the past, but maybe those people aren't here. <laughs> anyway, that's the best I can do. All right, so I'm gonna go on to talk about idealism, right? Which is basically the topic of part one. And again, there is no part two. <laughs> um, all right, so so first of all, let me start with the distinction between a substance and an accident or mode. That's an accident or something. So if you're in 100B, you've heard about this um, more than you ever wanted to. Uh, but uh, if not, I'll just say, um, I mean, and we saw Locke's version of this, right? But a substance is basically like a thing that has project pro properties. It's a subject of properties. And an accident or a mode is basically like the type of property that that thing has. So like, for example, Socrates is a substance and the color of Socrates is an accident or mode of Socrates. Is a, is a typical Aristotelian example, of course, we're going to see that, according to Barclay, that's not exactly right. <laughs> um, but that would be a typical type of Aristotelian example. Um, 
also the substance remains the same while the accidents change or or they can change right so like socrates can change color he can change size um he can change place etc and still be the same substance but only his accidents change Okay, so Barclay's basic thought is, and I guess I should say, so an accident is something that can only exist in something else, right? It requires a substance as its subject, as Aristotle says. It's what underlies it. So the word substance itself seems to have also have that etymology, right? Standing under, which uh, a lot of people, including including Locke, pick up on that's not actually the true etymology of the. I mean, that's not actually why the Latin word substantia is used for this, but uh, but it's not wrong because Aristotle does say that it's a hypocamenon that is a subject, right? So, uh, um, so the, the the substance is like provides the support. <laughs> for the accidents. They can't exist except in it. Um, so like a first pass kind of at explaining Barclay's idealism, like the basic thought is that first of all, An idea can only exist in something else. Now, this, in what sense of in is, I mean, it's going to be an issue, but it can only exist in something else. And the thing that it can exist in is in mind or spirit. Um. Actually, I made that point too here, but still not. Mm -hmm. Barclay uses these terms mind and spirit and a bunch of others interchangeably. Um, the point three is this is the only kind of in existence we understand. So you can't conceive of an idea or anything like an idea um, anywhere else. <laughs> So, right, so what we're saying is like ideas are accidents because they can only exist in something else. As Barclay says, um, um, this is section 73 of part one on page, bottom of page 51, when he's talking about how the, um, Um, how the idea of external substances, non-mental substances started, which according to him is a mistake, 
right? So he says, first, therefore, it was thought that color, figure, motion, and the rest of the sensible qualities or accidents did really exist without the mind. And for this reason, it seemed needful to suppose some unthinking substratum or substance wherein they did exist, since they could not be conceived to exist by themselves. So, right, so the part that's right is they can't be conceived to exist by themselves. The mistake was people thought they were outside the mind, and therefore they thought, well, they, they're accidents, they can't exist by themselves, so there must be some kind of non-mental substance, an unthinking substance. That was a mistake, but this part was right, right? But what they should have realized is that um, those qualities are accidents, are ideas, and we know what kind of substance they exist in, a mind. And we can't conceive of any other kind of existence of an accident in a substance. So we can't conceive of ideas or anything like that. Anywhere else except in a mind. So, like in particular, if you think, you know, that um, that an idea in the mind resembles the quality in some external body. Barclay is saying, you don't understand this. Right, you don't understand what an existence is. Um, so I'm gonna, try to come back and make some sense of why he says that. But first I wanna say a few things about, um, about what it means that, that there are only ideas because it doesn't mean that there are no things <laughs> um, according to Barclay. So, I mean, if thing is, Number thing equals race. So therefore, according to Barclay, idealism is not really opposed to realism. Because although everything is ideas, there are things. What are things? Things are certain kind of ideas. <laughs> um Well, there's also another sense of thing. So, um, this is a familiar problem with the English word thing. Um, which I probably haven't talked about before in this particular course. That um, in English, and interestingly, the same thing is true in Arabic, but not in most of the other, and in French, I guess, I'm not sure about French, but not in most of the other important philosophical languages. That, um, like, you can't say, normally, you can't say something like, I have a red in my pocket. You have to say, you have to supply a noun for the adjective to modify. So if you don't have any particular noun, like I have a red frog in my pocket, or I have a red candy in my pocket or whatever, then you have to supply some general noun. And one of the nouns we use for that is thing, the main one, right? So you say, I have a red thing in my pocket, or I have some thing red in my pocket, <laughs> right? Um, so thing in English has, um, when you try to use it for a particular kind 
right? And like, how can you say this in English? You have to say a particular kind of thing, <laughs> right? Um, it doesn't exactly work. <laughs> like there's always in the background that thing has to be the most general possible predicate. That, as I said, was also true in Arabic and that was how the theory of thing as a transcendental got started and whatever. And, um, but in the Middle Ages. But um, but so, I mean, this is kind of typical. Barclay, on the one hand, uses thing to mean a sensible object with multiple qualities that's actual, um, that's real, right? Real means thing, thingable, <laughs> right? But he also says thing is the most general uh, thing we can say, and it includes both ideas and spirits. So it includes all ideas and spirits, right? So, I mean, but let, leave aside that sense of thing for now, which is weird because any talking about spirits is weird. Because the word spirit doesn't stand for an idea, <laughs> right? So it's not meaningful in Locke's sense, but rather in some other sense. Okay, so let's get back to the narrow sense of thing. Um, so, I mean, we already saw one way he describes this in section one of part one on page 23, where he says, um, right, first he, he lists how I get ideas of the various senses, and then he says, and as several of these are observed to accompany each other, they come to be marked by one name and so to be reputed as one thing. So at this point, he's defining thing as something like complex idea, right? Like a snowball is a thing because the uh, idea of a snowball combines the uh, to write over here. Oh, in fact, some of the things I wrote are out of the book. Yeah, but it worked. Okay. Um, right, so like a snow, so like a snowball is white and brown and cold. And um, put these together. I mean, there isn't really a there isn't really a, a dish that the Doritos going here. But you put these things together, and you get the an idea. So we would normally say the idea of a snowball, right? Like Locke would say, you get the idea of a snowball. But remember, according to Barclay, there's only ideas. So this is a snowball. <laughs> so a snowball is a combination of these ideas. Now, um, um, if we left it at that, it would be like, uh, I mean, maybe even in section one, he doesn't mean that because he starts by discussing sensations in section one. But in any case, if we left it at that, there would be no difference between, we would have to call an imaginary snowball a thing, right? Like if an imagining a snowball or remembering a snowball or whatever. So, but uh, Barclay wants to say, like, so if Barclay were to say, there's only ideas. And so there's no difference between real snowballs, that is snowballs that are things, and imaginary snowballs, that is snowballs that are just images, then he would certainly be on a collision course with common sense, right? Like he couldn't claim that that was just plain common sense, that there's no difference between a real snowball and an imaginary snowball. So like to finish his definition of thing, he has to say like, what makes 
a certain idea or combination of ideas real. Yeah, again, like for Locke, I mean, first of all, for Locke, this is this is never the snowball. This is the idea of the snowball, right? But for Locke, we can say, you know, the actual existence of the snowball happens in the situation where there's a snowball outside the mind that cause that's causing this idea. So I'm sensing, right? Um, but uh, um, but Barclay doesn't have this. So what is the difference between a real snowball and imaginary snowball? So um, so there's basically three differences. I guess I'm gonna have a little piece. <laughs> I don't usually regret the but I always think I I think I already said that. All right, anyway. So, um, so I mean, a real thing is composed of sensations, <laughs> whereas an imaginary thing is composed of um, um, and Berkeley doesn't really exactly have a word for this, but because the word for it would be ideas. <laughs> but he's using idea to cover both sensations and the things like sensations that are not sensations, right? And so he says, um, um, something like ideas in a more proper sense or mere ideas or whatever. Um, so uh, sensations, that is things, that is realities, right? Because again, this comes, this, these are the same word. Thing and real. <laughs> Um, have these characteristics. First of all, they're not subject to my will. Right? I can't decide whether to have them or not. Um, this is something, you know, Locke says, Descartes says. Um, Number two, they're more strong or lively. Um, this is kind of a weird one, and this is going to be with us for a long time because this turns out to be really important to Hume also. Um, it's, I mean, I mean, you understand what he means, right? Like an imagined snowball is just not as impressive as a real snowball somehow <laughs> but it's not easy to say how right because it's not like the imagined snowball well i don't know i don't really know what mental imagery is really like <laughs> or even what that question means maybe it is actually kind of dark like <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's not the way Barclay and Locke are thinking about it, right? It, it is, it's not like the imagined snowball is less white than the, than the real snowball, like it's kind of gray or something, right? Like however bright a color something can be, that's, that same bright color can occur in an in a imagination or memory. Um. So um, it just means somehow it has more of an influence on us, something like that. Um, and the last one is um, that it's more regular, or that these type of ideas are regarded as a class, are more regular. Right, so like, 
my ideas my ideas properly speaking my ideas that are not sensations that depend on my will um barclay says often well here i'll leave it as on page section 30 on page 35 section there's no section 30 on page 34 section 30 on page 34 <laughs> the ideas of sense are more strong, lively, and distinct than those of the imagination. That was this one. Um, they have likewise a steadiness, order, and coherence, and are not excited at random, as those which are the effects of human wills often are, but in a regular train or series. So, um, and so, like, apparently, as you can see from that last sentence, these two are somehow connected. In fact, the end of the sentence is, I should have read the end of the sentence. Um, they're not excited at random as those which are the effects of human wills often are. Right, so being the effect of my will is what makes them irregular, basically. Um, uh, but in a regular train or series, the admirable connection whereof sufficiently testifies the wisdom and benevolence of its author. Right, so like it's because, or well, it's not clear which is because of which, or whether they need the same thing, but. It's, it's because these ideas are the effect of a will that's steadier and better than mine, that they, uh, that they display this admirable connection that my ideas don't. I mean, you know, when I say my ideas, we're talking about my ideas completely here, right? These are all ideas in someone's, some, finite spirits, some human beings mind. But some of them are merely my ideas because they're subject to my will. Like I'm the one who's causing them somehow. Um, so uh, uh, because my will is unsteady and, um, and unreliable that those ideas that depend on my will tend to be irregular and are maybe excited at random. Whereas on the other hand, it's because um, the, uh, these are not subject to my will, but are caused by a more powerful, steady, and reliable will, that they're more regular. And I guess also, although Barclay doesn't say this, that this is also supposed to be a, a result of the same thing. Right, that this more strong or lively character that they have is itself somehow reflects the power of the will that causes them. Um, so, like, um, so when cold and round and white occur together in a way that's not subject to my will, that's strong and lively. And it's part of the regular sequence that's prescribed by the by the laws of nature. That's when I say, "This is a snowball. This is a real snowball." And and and, and that's that's when I should say it, according to Barclay. It's when, and on the other hand, if these same ideas to get, occur together, but subject to my will. Um, and or less strong or lively um, and not part of that regular sequence, then I say, I'm merely imagining or remembering or expecting a snowball. I'm entertaining the idea of a snowball. Um, and so, um, so notice that these things, I mean, I think this is important, like, 
I don't know. I don't know if there's a temptation to think this or not. But if there is, you shouldn't be tempted. <laughs> Namely, so like when Barclay says that um, um, the snowball is an idea, he doesn't mean it's kind of ghostly, right? It's like big and solid and colorful and it can hurt you, <laughs> right? It's just that uh, all of those are descriptions of ideas. <laughs> um, and, and what does this come to? Well, it, you know, what, what's the difference then between saying that it's out here and it's in here? Well, it's, um, it's saying that these big, colorful, solid things that can hurt us um, are the immediate objects of our mind. Right, so like, remember, um, this is Locke's picture, right? If I take out that X, three bits back. Here's my mental X. And um, this body, because it has this quality that it's this power, is able to cause me to perceive this idea and by way of the idea, I refer to the quality of the body motion. Um, so, like, according to Locke, the thing that's real, that is the thing that's a thing, <laughs> that's big and powerful and whatever, is not the immediate object of my mind. It's represented in my mind by something else, an idea. But what Barclay is saying is, no, that um, thing that can hurt you, uh, make you cold, uh, cause you to perceive white, so to speak, I mean, it doesn't really do any of those things exactly. But I guess I, that thing that's big, colorful, sometimes painful, et cetera, that thing is the very thing that's the object of your mental act. Um, right, so this is part of his response to someone who says, that it's strange to say that we're fed and clothed and et cetera with ideas. This is section 38 of part one on page 37. But say you, it sounds very harsh to say we eat and drink ideas and are clothed with ideas. I acknowledge it does so. The word idea not being used in common discourse to signify the several combinations of sensible qualities which are called things, right? So it sounds harsh to say that we eat ideas and we drink ideas and we dress in ideas because what we eat and drink and dress in are things. That is, they have these characteristics <laughs> and um, it's not customary to call things ideas, right? He agrees that it's not customary in uh, um, ordinary language to call these ideas. But then he says, but this does not concern the truth of the proposition, which in other words is no more than to say, we are fed and clothed with those, with those things which we perceive immediately by our senses. Right, so, I mean, you can start seeing why he's gonna claim that his view is actually common sense. Right, because he's saying like, um, if you ask the, the spokesperson for common sense, is this a thing or an idea? They're gonna say, well, it's a thing, it's not an idea. 
I don't know if you know, Locke actually always italicized this idea as a foreign word. <laughs> um, but apparently Barclay already thinks that people, ordinary people use it. I don't know. Anyway, like if you um if you say to them, is this a thing or idea? They're gonna say it's a thing, it's not an idea. But then if you say to them, um is what you see and feel and taste the very thing that you eat and drink and are clothed by, they're gonna say, well, yeah, of course. And Barclay says, so you see, they really agree with me that it's um, these immediate objects of the mind uh, that that things are among the immediate objects of the mind. They're not something outside. Um, and therefore, they exist in the mind. I mean, That part is not as obvious, right? You might think the immediate object of the mind is something outside the mind. Um, but um, um, well, like I said, I'm gonna try to come back and say something more about this. I mean, this because this is the basic question of why he's an idealist. Right. Why say that the immediate object of the mind must be something in the mind? But I mean, I guess you can start by asking what in means. Um, and um, remember, Locke says, for an idea to be in the mind simply means that it's perceived by the mind. And like, what else could it mean? Um, because it doesn't mean the mind is like a bucket and that <laughs> snowballs are in the bucket. <laughs> what does it mean? It means that snowballs are the immediate objects of the mind. That's what it is to be in the mind. So like, um, um, the, the the question though, like that just pushes the question back or changes the wording of the question. Then the question is going to be something like, um, now I do regret erasing that. Why does whatever is in the mind in that sense have to be an accident of the mind? Why does it have to depend on the mind for its existence? Okay. Um, but I am not, I guess, first of all, should I ask, are there questions about what I said so far? Yes. I think you can say a lot, but so just having something that's more like drowning the actual objects. Let me say this idea that if someone was shot in the eye, like someone shot by a gun, they died, you just said they died from an idea. Um, Maybe they didn't know this. Yeah, so I mean, that of course is a particularly tricky example because it, like, so Barclay, um, um, doesn't think a spirit can actually be destroyed by an idea. So like, right, that would be kind of a proof of immortality, right? I mean, so, uh, but if, if you don't agree with that, then you're gonna say, well, after that, there was no more spirit. And so, right. So, I mean, I, it, I think it's better to take an example of like, you know, what would Barclay say about, I put my hand in the fire and it gets burnt. Well, um, so 
My hand is an idea. And the fire is another idea. And I mean, so my hand is like, this is also tricky. Maybe I should, this, this gets into the question of my, my control over my body, right? Like this is subject to my will, but not in the same sense as the imaginations or whatever are subject to my will. Um, so maybe I should just talk about like something falls me on the head, falls on, falls me on the head. Something falls, there must be some language where you can say that. But, um, something falls on my head and, it, and I have a headache. Right, so like my head is an idea, and the thing that falls is an idea, and the headache is an idea, <laughs> and um, um, and according to this admirable regular train of connections, um, the the um, complex idea of this idea moving down towards this one and hitting it and whatever is normally followed by the idea of pain. <laughs> um, and so, like, we come to expect it. And I was just talking in 106 about whether how Kant's claim that, that uh, empiricists can't really make sense of the of like what expecting means, <laughs> but forget, right? So like, um, we come to expect it. Um, and that's the purpose of the regular sequence, right? So like this, this example, I mean, although again, you have to, you have to explain in what sense we're able to, to um, change the idea of our own body to make it do things, right? But, um, but if you accept that, then you can see that. Um, so even though this, the idea of this movement and the idea of the idea of it stopping when it hits this, and the idea of pain, um, have no intrinsic relationship to each other. There's no visible necessary connection between them. Mm -hmm. um, in fact. Um, there's no visible necessary connection between ideas at all. Nevertheless, um, it's really useful that God always causes this pain after these other ideas, because now I can um, avoid pain by avoiding having this happen. <laughs> if there's no connection, then why do you Well, I, I mean, like as Barclay often points out, um, even people who believe, so he doesn't, he calls them materialists, which is, uh, which is kind of funny because materialist is a bad word because it means someone who only believes in matter, right? But for but Barclay uses it to mean someone who believes in matter at all, <laughs> right? So the materialists, as Barclay often points out, even the materialists have to admit that by a miracle, God could make the thing, um, do a backflip and not hit my head, or God could make it hit my head and not, and it wouldn't hurt me, right? Just God can like make me walk through a fire and be preserved or a den of lions or whatever, right? So, um, so like if we're gonna allow God to violate the laws of nature, which he can, according to Barclay, uh, if we're gonna allow God to violate the laws of nature, then of course, one way or the other, this isn't going to be reliable. But the point is, since um, God almost always does follow these laws, right? It's the sequence is always regular. Um, and 
even though it's really just like a sequence of movie frames. Right, like this one doesn't cause this one. This one just happens after. <laughs> oh, uh, there's but there's a common cause of both. Of them. Someone arranged in order, um, and because of that, you can you know you can use this one to. This is the one where I have a headache. Right, so like um, you can use this one to predict this one. Mm -hmm. And you can predict also what will happen if you do other things with your body. So like if you move this direction, you can predict that this thing is not gonna suddenly start flying and following you like a guided missile, right? It's gonna, it's gonna just keep following the way it was. And so it won't hit you and you won't have a, does that help? Yeah. Is people on the mind body problem? Is it then that the mind steering in the body is the idea that allows us to interact with the other ideas of the world? Yeah, I mean, it's clearly some, it's clearly a special, my own body is clearly a special idea. Um, um, Barclay doesn't spend a lot of time talking about that, but uh, but it's obviously true for his right. Like it's very, it's it's. I mean, it's. Uh, but like, I guess what he doesn't have. So like the idea of my body is kind of special in the way my body is for Descartes or for Locke, right? Like for Descartes or Locke, my body is a special thing to me because I only feel pain in it, not elsewhere. Right? And because I can only directly control its motions and not other things. Um, so, but then if you ask for why, Right, like what's the connection between your mind and that body? That's the mind-body problem, right? Um, they don't have anything to say. Like Spinoza and Leibniz have something to say, although it's weird, but, but like Descartes and Locke don't really have anything to say about that. So it seems like mysterious, but according to Berkeley, it's no more mysterious than any other regularity here. Right, it's like for my convenience that God has set aside this special idea, <laughs> so I know that any pain I'm going to feel is always going to be associated with that idea, <laughs> and so on and so forth. Um, um, okay, so this was. I think it's necessary. Why is it not? I'm going to have a digression here on the question, do things exist because they're perceived by God? <laughs> um, by which I mean, does Barclay say that things exist because God constantly perceives them? So um, this possibility is first raised in section six of part one on page 25. Um, Right, he says, um, all the choir of heaven and furniture of the earth, in a word, all those bodies which compose the mighty frame of the world have not any subsistence without a mind. Their being is to, perceive, to be perceived or known. And consequently, so long as they are not actually perceived by me, or do not exist in my or, or do not exist in my mind, or that of any other created spirit, they must either have no existence at all, or else subsist in the mind of some eternal spirit. Right? So he's suggesting, so like the picture is this. I mean, it's hard to draw this picture because his mind's. Not in space. It's the same problem 
what do you encounter when you get to Leibniz in 100 degrees? Um, the, these minds are not in space, but I can only draw them in space. You know, like here's mind one, here's mind two. So the thought is that, like, let's say mind one is my mind, and mind two is your mind. So when, so like when I'm facing this way, the table is an idea in my mind. Here's that table. Now, when I turn around, um, the idea of the table in my mind goes away. I mean, that is the real idea of the table in my mind, right? I might still remember it or whatever, but the one that's strong and lively and et cetera goes away. And so this was the table. So when I turn around, there is no table. But no, Barkeep says maybe. Uh, even when I turn around, you're still looking at the table. So, like, this is your mind. So, uh, when, like, we're both looking at it, the table is an idea in both of them somehow. But then, when I turn around, uh, the table still exists because there's still this idea in your mind that's also the table. Yeah. So, what would Berkeley say about slopes as a measure? How would we know whether something is being perceived or is God always perceived or does God know whether something is being perceived by a human at all times? Yeah, so... Because he doesn't talk about slopes. Solipsism, yeah. Um, you might think we would have solipsism. But In Latin, so yeah, yeah. But, uh, but not in the All right. Anyway, um, so, uh, but then what if you also turn around or close your eyes or whatever? Now the table is definitely different. Oh, but what if there's an eternal spirit? I mean, mind divinity. <laughs> there's an eternal spirit. An eternal spirit never turns around and closes its eyes or whatever, right? So the table is always there. So that's why the table exists. Yeah. So if there's an eternal spirit that is like constantly perceiving, um, then isn't that like operationally the same as matter? Like because there's never an instance in which something is not being perceived. And so if everything is being perceived all the time, yeah. then it's basically operating the same as if it is. Yes. Well, um, I mean, so first of all, but if by operationally, mm -hmm. you mean that if by operationally you meant just that it causes the same sensible effects that matter, yes. then um, of course, that's the whole idea, right? And that's why matter is superfluous. Gotcha. Okay. In addition to absurd, it's also useless, as it keeps explaining. Um, but, like, uh, but of course, this thing, you know, well, should I say, of course? I mean, first of all, mm -hmm. I'm going to argue that there is no, that, 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 that although Barclay suggests this sometimes, it doesn't mean it's a, like, so, but let's say for a moment he did mean that. So, like, um, if you wanted to say this is the real, and this is just an image, you would have to say this idea in God's mind causes the idea in my mind. But ideas in God's mind would be just as inert as any other. Right? Inertness belongs to the nature of an idea. It's not a failure of my mind that makes them inert. So, like, it's not true that this would be the cause of this. You might think something more complicated, like that the aspect of God's will that's responsible for this is also responsible for this. Mm -hmm. um, 
but um, uh, I'll get back to this, but I'll just say that my, that would mean that we know some primary qualities of spirits. And that would be equivalent of a lot of spirits. <laughs> But that's exactly what Barclay is going to deny. And it's actually what Locke himself denies in the case of mind and spirit. Right? Uh, they, they, I think Locke thinks that uh, we don't know any primary qualities. Uh, no primary qualities are given in reflection. I think I never had a chance to talk about that. But you can kind of see that from the discussion of the will and so forth, where he says, that basically that they're bare powers, right? That all the powers of the, all the faculties of the mind are bare powers. Um, all right, anyway, sorry, I don't have time to go back and explain more. So, um, right, so, so anyway, this would be the suggestion that the table always exists because even when it doesn't exist in, in finite mind, it always exists in this mind. Um, and, um, you know, there's even a stronger suggestion of this in section 48, and there's some even more explicit ones in the dialogues, um, the dialogues between Hylos, Hylos and Philonous, Philonous, or however you pronounce that. Um, but, um, and this is the view that you often hear attributed to Barclay. In fact, like, um, if, People know anything about Barclay, it's usually this that Barclay thinks that things exist because there are ideas in the divine mind. Um, and, like, do you ever read that thing called Existential Comics? No, I don't, I don't really recommend it. It's not very funny. But, but it's, like a, it's like a comic strip where in every episode there's like three or four famous philosophers and they have some kind of they're like playing checkers and they have a fight with each other or something. Right. So anyway, and like the Barclay character in that will always say something about this being an idea in the mind of God, right? Because that's like the Barclay stereotypical thing. Right. So, um, but um, I don't think that he could mean this literally. Because first of all, what purpose would it serve for God to have ideas like that? I mean, um, we have ideas as like signs of the divine will. And that is, they're semantic signs of the divine realm. They're signs that refer outside of the system of signs to something else, a spirit. That's, that's why we have sensations or complexes of sensations like the table. And then we have our own ideas because um, we can make our own ideas into syntactic signs of the divine idea. Right, that is like by going through a chain of our ideas according to certain rules we've set up, we hope to get back to the sensation we're actually going to have. But God doesn't need a sign of his own will. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, Barclay makes fun of a view that's very similar to this in section 74. Where, so he's discussing here the view that um, matter or unthinking substance so that like the materialist has given up on thinking they know anything about it basically. And they're just saying, and also given up on the thought that it actually affects us. But it's that they say, 
But nevertheless, isn't it possible that matter exists as the occasion on which God causes certain sensations in us? This is basically Malbranche's view. So I guess I shouldn't have said before that Barclay is always arguing with Locke because he's sometimes arguing with Malbranche. <laughs> um, so, right, so like, so now the picture is that, um, I perceive an idea. There's a body that has a quality, but um, there's no connection between these things except by way of the divine will, right? And it's just that when God um, uh, arrives at this occasion in his conduct of the world, he also causes me to perceive this idea. Um, it's called the system of occasional causes. Leibniz also argues against it. Um, so Barclay says in section 74, he says, well, um, um, what this really actually, what he said earlier um, about this view is that what it really comes to is that there's certain unknown ideas in the divine mind, right? Because this thing is inert <laughs> now, right? We're now admitting that this is inert. So it's not a substance, it's an idea. But it's not an idea in our mind, because that's the whole point here. So where is it? Well, it's, I mean, God is using it as an occasion to cause something in our mind. So it must be the God's mind. So, like, matter is a series of unknown ideas in the divine mind, which God uses, and Barton said, it's kind of like a musician using notes, right? So the musician looks at the notes and knows what tune to play, and the audience just hears the notes and doesn't, just hears the tune and doesn't have to even know that the notes exist. So that's what matter would be like. It would be like this unknown like, score that God is following. Like, okay, what do I cause in mind 20x? Oh, it says this, right? And then Barclay says, um, what is there on our part, or what do we perceive amongst all the ideas, sensations, notions, which are imprinted on our minds, either by sense or reflection, from whence may be inferred the existence of an inert, thoughtless, unperceived occasion? And on the other hand, on the part, so right, so first of all, it says there's no reason to think there is such. But then he says, and on the other hand, on the part of an all-sufficient spirit, what can there be that should make us believe or even suspect he is directed by an inert occasion to excite ideas in our minds? Right? God doesn't need these like notes to remind him what to do. He just has a will. And that's enough. Yeah. Okay, the idea what do you say about Locke's idea about the Fluid chain of reason, where you go from one idea to the next, and fluidly by by logic. In that sense, it kind of seems like ideas are actively being connected to one another. Um. Well, uh, no, I'm not making that face because you're completely misunderstanding. I'm making that face because I'm trying to figure out exactly what to say about that. Um. I mean, how Barclay thinks logical reasoning actually works. Um, I mean, he obviously relies on the principle of contradiction and everything. <laughs> so uh, he obviously thinks it does work something. How exactly it works, I'm not sure, but. Um, uh, but the, the important thing is that um, uh, even Locke doesn't claim that, that, that the relationship between those ideas is that one causes the other. Um, Mm 
mean it to be incompatible. And this is a theory of God, it's going to tell me what to say. Oh. <laughs> I mean, for one to cause the other would be. On the one hand, like superfluous. On the other hand, too much, right? So on the one hand, Locke doesn't think one causes the other because he thinks that in all those cases, we can have one idea without the other, right? And that's why we, we have to learn. Even in the case of intuitive propositions, we have to learn that they're true, right? And we may have to be instructed so we can definitely have one without the other. And on the other hand, just because um, one idea always causes the other, it doesn't allow us to see that there's a necessary connection. I, so uh, like that would just be something that happens to us, right? So yeah, but um, so that's the best I can do because I can't, because like I said, I'm not sure I understand how Barclay thinks logic works, as opposed to like arithmetic and geometry, which has to do with our setting up arbitrary signs, according to him. But he can't say that about logic. And well, anyway, never mind. Um, um, I have to get through this quickly or else I'm not going to get to any of the stuff about idealism. So yeah, so I'll just say, right, so number one, um, by the same token, it seems like God has no use for this supposed idea of Cato always there. So it's it's it, at a minimum it's without purpose. Um, but um, but also like even if we accept that God has ideas of quote unquote everything in His mind all the time when we don't. It's not clear exactly what that's going to get that get us, right? So, like, um, so su suppose we say that God has an idea of the table in mind, even when we all close our eyes. So the thought is, uh, first of all, the thought is not that God has the exact same idea that we, right? Because even in this case, that's not true. It's like I'm seeing one side of the table and you're seeing the other side of the table is the way we would normally describe this. But Barclay has to describe it by saying, I have one idea of the table. That is, I have one idea that is the table and you have a different idea that is the same table. So, I mean, there's really two tables in which it's, and in the dialogues he actually says that it's not true. But it's just a manner of speaking that we call them all the same table. But still, they're the same type of idea. They have a certain correspondence between them, right? So, um, but now if you ask, like, so this this idea in the divine mind is supposed to be, although it's not exactly our idea, it's supposed to be like it. It's supposed to have the same color, I guess, or the same shape or something. But what color is it? Ray, like, um, what color do cows look in the dark to God? Right? Alluding to the famous saying, in the dark, all cows are black, <laughs> which uh, Hegel uses to phrase that. Fish anyway, <laughs> um, says that Fishian absolute is, or is it Shelley? Anyway, one of them. It says, your absolute is the, is, is the night in which all cars, cows are black. Right, but like, but of course, uh, the whole point of God is, you know, as Locke says, he sees men in the dark, right? Like just turning off the light can't make God stop seeing the table, right? So the table, but you know, so when the lights are on, does it look the same color to God as it does to us? 
Well, I mean, you know, if we made the light brighter, it would look different to us. How bright does the light look to God? <laughs> um, and moreover, and uh, um, to different eyes, like eyes of different um, acuity or differently stationed, as Barclay will say, the, the table is going to have a different size and shape. Right, so like I'm closer to the table than you are. So my table idea is bigger. And also in general shape, I mean, forgetting just the fact that we're seeing different sides of it or whatever, the shape is different because I see more details. So like if I'm closer to the table, my idea is gonna is have a different shape for me. How close is God to the table? <laughs> right? How close is God's eye to the table? Well, you might want to say God is infinitely close to the table. And so God, so where where each of us, right, you see a certain finite number of parts. You'll see Barclay thinks that the, uh, the visible and tangible ideas are composed of smallest indivisible parts. So um, you see a certain finite number of parts. I see a larger finite number of parts in the table. So you might think God sees an infinite number of type parts in the table. But Barclay says that an infinite body would have no shape. This is part of another part of his objection. Again, it's an object part of his objection to Locke's primary secondary quality distinction. This is section 47 on page four, uh, part one on page 41. Um, um, each body, therefore, considered in itself is infinitely extended, right? So he's he's drawing out the consequence of Locke believing on the one hand that a body, that a, that a body really does have a shape that resembles the shape of my idea, you know, the primary quality. But on the other hand, Locke's saying that body is infinitely divisible, right? So he says, well, like it's infinitely divisible, meaning that like um, in itself, it has infinitely many parts. And this is the consequence he draws. Each body therefore considered in itself is infinitely extended and consequently void of all shape or figure. From which it follows that though we should grant the existence of matter to be ever so certain, yet it is withal as certain the materialists themselves are by their own principles forced to acknowledge that neither the particular bodies perceived by sense nor anything like them exists without the mind. Right? So he's, so he's saying that, like, according to law, there's supposed to be something like my idea in, of the table outside my mind. Only unlike my idea of the table, this thing has infinitely many parts. And Barclay says, although obviously this is the part that Locke disagrees with, something that has infinitely many parts must be infinitely big. <laughs> and if it's infinitely big, then it doesn't have a limit and therefore it doesn't have a shape. And so Barclay's conclusion against Locke even if I agree that this supposed material thing exists, you're not going to be able to convince me that it's anything like your idea. For example, your idea has a shape and this thing doesn't. So if you thought that God saw the table infinitely, then God's idea of the table would be nothing like God's shape, according to God. So, you know, um, whatever it is, if anything, that God sees, and by the way, why I think that God has the same sense of right? I mean, yeah. but, but whatever it is that God sees and feels and, and smells or whatever, right? So, I mean, the Bible God smelling all the time, but, uh, you know, right? The whole point of offering animal sacrifices is to raise a pleasing odor, 
to the Lord. Presumably that's even uh, it's the All right. In any case, I mean, according to according to all normal geometry, they've got that meta. Um, so uh, um, so whatever God sees, it has to be completely different from what we see. I mean, uh, and therefore, like, whatever reassurance we're trying to give common sense by saying, oh, the table is still there when we not close our eyes because it's in God's mind, is... Um, uh, really, you're not really getting that out of us, right? Because whatever remains in God's mind is nothing like our idea of the table. So it's so it's both these things both have no purpose in Martin's system, and they also, I think, if you think about it more clearly, they don't serve his rhetorical purpose at this point if you take it literally. I mean, the truth is. What really still exists when we all close our minds is the same thing Locke says still exists. We all close our eyes, sorry. It is the same thing Locke says still exists when we all close our eyes, namely the power to cause these perceptions in us. And the power to cause these perceptions in us is the divine will. And the divine will always, sure enough, always exists even when we close our eyes. But then, if we say, well, wait, then the divine will is in this. The table does exist. Again, the, the question is going to be whether the divine will resembles the idea that it causes. And um, um, since Barclay says there can be no necess visible necessary connection between ideas. That means there can be no resemblance between the idea and the power that causes them. Right? There's, there can't be an analogy or isomorphism between the divine will and that detail of the power. So the idea is a sign of the divine will, but we don't learn what the divine will is like in the sense of developing a picture of it. Um, and that's why it's not a table or a tree or anything else. Although it's the power that causes us to perceive all those things. Um, Okay, so in conclusion, Barclay doesn't straight out say, he just kind of suggests it, and I think um, doesn't, like, strictly speaking, doesn't believe that uh, the ideas of everything constantly exist in the divine mind. Um, okay. What should I talk about? Spirits, I have to talk about that. Argument against the existence of matter. I have to talk about that. What makes the realists or materialists go wrong? I have to talk about that. And yet I don't have time to talk about all of them. Oh, well. <laughs> Damn. So much for us and twice can. All right. Um, I'm just going to start talking about spirits um, and see what I get to. You. I might be able to just make up some of it next time. Um, so, right. So, idealism really is. So idealism means that uh, things uh, um, all have their existence in a mind or spirit. But what is a mind or spirit? Right. 
Right, so I mean, in a sense, it's pretty straightforward. This is section two on page 23. But besides all that endless variety of ideas or objects of knowledge, there's likewise somewhat something which knows or perceives them and exercises diverse operations as willing, imagining, remembering about them. This perceiving act of being is what I call mind, spirit, soul, or myself. Um, so a spirit is not an idea. And this also means we don't have an idea of a spirit. Um, so the spirit is not an idea. There's no, of a spirit. Because, like, according to Berkeley, what does having an idea of something mean? So it depends on whether it's real or imaginary, <laughs> right? Or that is, if um, in the case of the real table, having an idea of the table means that I have the idea that is that table. Um, but in the case there is no real table, but I have an idea of the table, that means that one of my own less lively, you know, less regular ideas that depends on my will stands for the table. Um, resembles the, the real table or in some other way, stands for. So like, since the spirit is not an idea, I can't have an idea of a spirit in that first sense, right? That would mean that the spirit is an idea that I have, but a spirit is not an idea. And since, um, uh, uh, and the second sense is also ruled out because that would have to, that would have to mean that my idea somehow stands for or resembles the idea that is the spirit, but there is no idea that is the spirit. I mean, of course, in a strict sense of idea of, so if my idea of, again, this is, I feel like, I don't know why, I haven't got a chance to discuss this in an organized way. I did when we talked about Locke's view of language, the difference between a semantic sign and a syntactic sign, right? So if like strictly speaking, idea of would mean the, the thing that's not an idea that the idea points onto. Oh. That's the semantic, that's the idea as semantic sign. So in that sense of idea of, every idea is the idea of a spirit. That's the only thing ideas are ideas of. Right? They all refer me to the will of the spirit that caused them. Uh, um, and, in, and in that sense, I don't have an idea of a table or a tree or anything like that. Those are ideas, but I don't have ideas of them. Right? But I have, I, they, all those is like the, the table is an idea of the divine will. <laughs> and the remembered table is an idea of my own will. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but in the ordinary sense where we say, I have idea, I have an idea of a table. I have an idea of a tree. In that sense, I don't have an idea of a spirit. Um, so. What are we talking about when we talk about spirits? 
Well, one thing Barclay says about this, which at first blush seems to make the problem worse rather than better. This is in section 27 on the bottom of page 33. This actually, this is a, it's in brackets that shows it's a passage he added in the second edition, I believe is what that means. Though it must be owned at the same time that we have some notion of soul, spirit, and the operations of the mind, such as willing, loving, hating, inasmuch as we know or understand the meaning of those words. So how does mentioning the words help? <laughs> Right, like I was asking you, what are you talking about when you say, you know, in addition to ideas, there are also spirits. Um, do you have, uh, how can that mean anything if it, if like it does, if there's no idea that it stands for? And Barclay says, well, but we understand what the word means. I mean, like I thought the whole idea here, so to speak, was. <laughs> To uh, we were going to consider ideas bare without bringing in our words. Right? Remember all that stuff in the introduction about that? Um, and now, all of a sudden, when we get to this very important thing, the only kind of substance we know exists, the only thing that, that our ideas really represent, et cetera, et cetera, a mind or a spirit, and we ask, um, what is this, Barclay? And he says, well, you understand the word. <laughs> So I think the, the reason the word comes in here is that you have to remember that the fundamental purpose of language, right? So for Locke, if I say there's no idea corresponding to the word spirit, that means the word spirit is meaningless because the meaning of an idea is the idea the meaning of a word is the idea that I use it as a sign of. And um, the purpose of using the word is to get you to have the same idea. But Barclay says, that's not the fundamental purpose of language. It's not to communicate ideas. It's to express my will, basically. And have an effect on your will. <laughs> like ghosts, <laughs> right? Um, so, um, a spirit, <laughs> all right, um, so, um, so when I say, like, I mean, so first of all, so remember why Barclay said this in general, right? Like if I say, give me the gold, then what I want is for you to give me the gold. And by, by saying it, I express my will for you to give me the gold. And I hope to affect your will to make you give it to me. And if in the meantime, part of how that happens is that it excites the word gold, the idea of gold in your mind, fine. But if not, also fine, I don't care, right? That wasn't the purpose. Um, so like, now in this case, there is no idea corresponding to the word spirit. And there is no idea corresponding to this idea, to this word in existence. Um, but when I say this, I express my will. Um, so I am talking about a spirit <laughs> and the meaning of my word is a spirit, right? That is by saying spirit, I express a spirit. <laughs> and really that's true of all my words, right? But it's just in, in many cases, I express the fact about my spirit that consists in there being a certain idea. But in this case, there's no idea. I just express it directly. 
Um, and why do I say it to you? Well, presumably to affect your will somehow, right? So, um, so all these words are not meaningless according to Bhakti, but um, their meaning is basically practical somehow. Um, now, um, you might ask, how does that work exactly? Well, okay, so since I'm, I'm not going to get to this, there's only two minutes left. <laughs> Skip ahead to what the error of the materialist says. Um, so here's page 50, here's section 54 on the bottom of page 43. So he's dealing with an objection there, right? He's dealing with the objection that says, um, doesn't all mankind believe in the existence of matter? And isn't that an argument that you must be wrong, right? How could they all be right, wrong and you're right? And he says, um, I answer first that upon a narrow inquiry, it will not perhaps be found so many as is imagined do really believe the existence of matter or things without the mind. Strictly speaking, to believe that which involves a contradiction or has no meaning in it is impossible. So he says, you know, strictly speaking, no one believes in the existence of matter because it involves a contradiction and no, you can't believe it. But then he says, in one sense, indeed, men may be said to believe that matter exists. That is, they act as if the immediate cause of their sensations, which affects them every moment and is so nearly present to them, were some senseless, unthinking being. Right? So they act as if, in another place, he says that we, we, we erect material substances as a screen between us and God. Right? So it's a defect in our will. We don't want to act as if God is always watching us, as if God is right there. <laughs> we want so to put something else in between. And so when you say something like, God is the immediate cause of all sensations, right? So like, This whole part is about spirits. <laughs> right? This isn't this isn't an idea. And although immediate and cause might convey an idea in some context, here they don't. This is about the power of a spirit, not an idea. So why am I saying this to you? Well, it's the opposite of the reason the materialist says the opposite. Right? That is, the materialist says, God is not the immediate cause of all his sensations. In fact, maybe God doesn't exist, right? So what that means is you can act as if God isn't there. And Barclay, what he means in saying this is don't act that way. <laughs> or, I mean, I shouldn't say that's what he means, but... That's the effect of it. <laughs> okay, I'm out of time. So I will hope to say more about the arguments for idealism next time, I guess. See you then.